All right, Ezekiel 37, very familiar portion of scripture, but I want to personalize this and individualize this. I want you to walk in the power that God wants you to have. You know what? Man, pastor was anointed today. Oh, God, I hope that don't shock people. <laughs> I want to be, I want to look at and say, man, our church is anointed. Because our people are anointed, and our homes are anointed, and our children are anointed. And we walk on the job, the boss knows we're anointed. And pretty soon, he gets anointed because they're, they're drawn. People are drawn to what God can do. I want to take a quick minute and thank, thank those that helped us get the shovel on the wall, the poster, and all that. And I want you, and if you got something private and personal, I tell you, take one of those papers. Put an envelope, write your name on it, and pin it to that board. And when it comes, to, when it happens, you yank that off there and you say, "We, I'm going to tell you about this, Pastor, and we're going to make a big deal out of it. Come on. Anybody got a what if? I got some what ifs. Kind of got a what if in our text a little bit. The hand of the Lord was upon me, and he carried me out in the spirit of the Lord and set me down in the midst of the valley, which was full of bones. He caused me to pass by them round about, and behold, there were very many in the open valley. You ever know, this is a lot of dead folks. Well, let's, how many of you just walk around and feel spiritually dead? I just, I'm just not, you know, I'm not feeling it today. <laughs> it's all right, we'll be real. And lo, they were very dry. And he said unto me, Son of man, can these bones live? And I answered, Lord God, thou knowest. How many believes he knows? I'm going to skip down to verse 4. And he said unto me, prophesy. When you take the word prophesy, see, y'all think that's this. What's the problem? It means to speak. Now, I, I, I'm not going to speak for you ladies because I'm not one, regardless of what the world says you can do. I'm a dude. I'm a guy. When they dig up my bones, if God tarries 100 years from now, they're going to know, check the DNA in the bones, I'm going to be, they're going to know I was a dude. They're going to know I was a male. You guys, you know when you're working on a project, you ever speak to that project? I cut that board twice, and it's still too short. Bless God, I'm going to make you. <laughs> oh, you, you ever you, working on a motor? You speak to that. I've, I've watched us. I've watched you. I've seen some of it. It's what we do. You got that little kid, don't understand a bit of English, but it get out of hand, Sister Julissa. So you know you're going to do what I said. You're speaking to it. You got a problem in your house. You speak at it. I was, I, I was, I was reading. I was right. I was so inspired. Um, this week, and all of a sudden I heard the sound of an airplane crashing, and I was like, oh, the dogs even perked their ears up. I'm like, I was going to go see what it was, and I heard this, like, the whining sound, like, Yee. and then my house started vibrating. I'm like, oh, what? The devil is like, I got up and started walking, and I walked right underneath the intake, and I heard my air conditioning die. I went, devil, you a lying dog. You messing with me? I was speaking to it. Have I got your attention? Now you really, we, you got that cake rising in, 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 in the stove and one of the kids come in and bang a door. Oh, you, you talking at it. You hear what I'm saying? He's telling, speak upon these bones. We're told and admonished if we're going to do anything, ask it in his name. Speak Amen. it. Amen. You want a new job. I'm going to get a new job. Who are you saying that to? You're speaking to the situation. And say unto them, oh, ye dry bones. Hear the what? Hear the word of the Lord. Wait a minute. He's speaking. God empowered him. You speak to your situation. Get involved in your situation. Don't get angry, get upset, get prayerful about your situation. 
1 Thessalonians 5.17 declares, pray without ceasing. Lord, I'm going to need your help today. If you place your Bible down, let's talk to the Lord. There are needs throughout this house that we know you know, and there is a, a door open to us, Lord, and effectual that if we would come into this house and be people of prayer, people that would seek your face, people that would focus our attention on you and lay aside the worry and the fretting and focusing on, on touching you, Lord, and getting in contact with you and seeking your will, Lord, that you would help us, you would walk with us. And even if we're walking through the, the valley of the shadow of death, we wouldn't have to fear that evil because you're with us, God. Help me today by your divine unction to bring forth this word and everybody say in Jesus name. Amen. Turn to someone, give them a high five and you can be seated if you're going to have a good attitude. If not, you just stay standing up like me. Paul addressing Timothy, he makes a statement that's often overlooked and he talks about prayer and, and, and man, I, I, I want to deal with us. We're fixers. We want to get our hands on things. Our wonderful wives come in with an emotional issue. And it's not that they really want us to fix us. They just want us to. God wants to hear from you. Did you hear what I just said? So Paul, speaking to his charge, Timothy, I will therefore that men pray everywhere. Men? Say prayer. Prayer. Everywhere. everywhere. Lifting up holy hands. Listen to, what it, listen to the admonition, guys. Because when we're speaking at a job, our wrath is probably at like a level eight out of ten. We, Lifting up your hands is biblical and recommended, guys. Yes, it is. I just don't get emotional like that. That's why I don't get emotional. Just put them up. It's called surrender. It's out of my hands, God. I'm going to trust you. Without wrath and doubting, because that's our struggle. But listen, ladies, I want you to get this. In like manner also, because men need to submit. Ladies, and I know we don't like this word. Me submit to him. No, I want to submit to God's word. Let me help you here. Man, I don't want to get on this. What are y'all doing to me? It's not about you submitting to him. It's about you being right with God, which means you'll submit to him. But understand, if he's not treating you like the Bible says, he won't even hear, God won't hear your prayers. The mandate isn't if he's right. The mandate you do right, regardless of what he's doing, because God will deal with that joker. Don't you turn around and, 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 and be whatever you call it to today's world to your husband because you want to teach him a lesson because you now violated what God's asked you to do. You, you see, see, when you live for God, it's 100% and 100% regardless of what the other person's doing. And God has a recourse for these other things. Are you with me on that? That's Bible. That's Bible. So that's not what I want to preach about today, but that was free. In like manner also that women adorn themselves because men today are being violated by society's use of them. And women today are being violated. Uh -huh. Y'all like, like that? Y'all like the image y'all have to look like, ladies? It's sad that y'all beautiful, but the whole world tells you you got to get all them filters. Because God didn't do a good job. That women adorn themselves in modest apparel. It matters what you wear. With shamefacedness. With sobriety. Not with broided hair, or gold, and pearls, or costly ray. You hearing me? We need praying men without wrath and doubting. And praying ladies that emit godliness in how they dress. It's Bible. It's not going to feel good when you're worldly. That's going to bother you. But when you're seeking the face of God, I'm a, I, I want to please God. 
And that, us guys, oh, don't worry. We got ours too. That joker getting angry at the house? That seems a little bit like wrath and doubting, honey. Lay it on the joker. Are you hearing me? Be Bible. Many years ago, and I know I'm dating myself here, but kerosene or oil lamps had to be tended to. They had to be worked with. You just couldn't just fill them with oil and light them and walk away. They had wicks and you had to keep them cool. And they had to be cleaned and you had to trim them because if you didn't, they would smoke that cloud blast and they wouldn't work properly. Does that make sense? The, the same is true for us. We have to make sure that we have the oil, the anointing, so that our light shines properly and we're not filling up the room with smoke that hurts everybody's eyes. Am I okay here? So, understand that these are the things that we need to understand and we need to get. If you claim to have the Holy Spirit living in you, your life should show it. Like that lamp, there should be light. Light is needed when darkness is present. So when you're going through something, blowing up and huff, acting like a joke and getting mad and throwing a fit, not exactly what God's looking for. Now, wait a minute. Did I just pretty much say what we all do? That's why it's in there, because we all do it. And God wants us to be different. I'm not saying you, I'm saying us. I'll just go ahead and say I'm the chief sinner. I'm the, I'm the worst one. I'm okay with that. So how do we how do we how do we how do we change? How do I how do we invoke and, and walk and, and how, how does our life anybody tired of maybe being in the same spot? David makes a statement that said, Thou anointest my head with oil. It was his son that said that your head should never be without the anointing. That means God is the one who anoints, but it's our responsibility to get in position for the anointing to maintain it. How do we do that? Spending time in his presence. Now, I don't know about you, but how many drives around in the car with your radio on? So you're spending time with whoever you're listening to. How many, when you're at home, as soon as you get home, there's a square box or whatever, it comes on and you got that on. So you're spending time with that. You got all these influences, all these things that you're spending your time in its presence. How often do you spend in the presence of the Lord? So let, let's, let's just go ahead and be honest. No wonder I'm not as anointed as powerful as the things of God. So let's not blame God for not showing up let's blame myself because I didn't give him a chance. It's just, it's the honesty okay today. I, you know what the wonderful and the powerful thing about realizing that you might be the problem or the issue is now you can fix it. That's empowering. Because if, if it's always somebody else's fault, you're powerless. That's why nothing gets fixed in your life. It's really not them, it's you. So how do we get in, get in his word? Okay. Please don't raise your hands, but just, you know, in turn, how many really spent time in reading the word this week? So prayer, reading the word. How many stopped after being in prayer and being in his word, submitting to what you were given? It's hard to get to the submission when you're not even being in his presence and you're not listening to what he's saying. Say something to me. Sister Vanilla, say something to me. How rude. Someone's talking to you and you don't respond. You know the Lord's speaking to us and we just obliviously go without prayer and we turn, we're, we're ignoring the high holy one. And we're, well, where's God when I need him? You ran him off weeks ago. Does this make sense? The practicalness of where we live, the practicalness of how we live, the practicalness that we've been given these specific things, but we're not doing them. 
Your child comes home with some schoolwork for you to do. What's the first thing you do? You sit down with it, you read it, you find out, and you say, well, this is, we can teach a child what they need to do to get something right, but we're not going to be. God doesn't and won't anoint a stubborn head. If you're stubborn, I got a stump in my backyard. I'm not going to go out there and spend time talking to the stump. It ain't going to listen. Some of us are like that law. God's been telling you something for years. You have moved. You're telling God to me. He's like, wait a minute. I can't move in your life because you're stubborn. God's not going to anoint a self-willed head. A rebellious head. A lazy head. Can we be honest? The kid comes home, you're not doing your work, no wonder you're getting an F. You're being lazy. I sit you down, I have you spend an hour at the table, you don't do anything. You're rebelling against that. No wonder you're not passing the clock. How many of us? We want the power of God. We want the anointing of God. We want all that, but we're doing just like a student that's not passing the class. We're not doing the simple things we were given. One of the most important ways to keep the anointing in your life is to be in the right position in the body of Christ. One famous writer said, if you're not moving forward, you're backsliding. You're backsliding if you look back at your life to see a time when you were closer to God and more on fire for God and then than you are today. You basically backslid. Proverbs 4 and 18 says, 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 the Bible says, the path of the just is as a shining light that shineth more and more unto a perfect day. That means our light, our fire, our fervency is supposed to get bigger and brighter all the time until we're completely consumed and completely on fire for God. It should improve. Why is it that we think, well, okay, I'm done all I'm going to do. I'm going to become darkness and go sit on the sidelines. We were created for that fire. We were created to be that light. We were created to live on fire. We were created to be creatures of fire. We were created to carry that fire, that anointing. It's the plan of God and the will of God that everything that we touch, it's on fire. Whatsoever the hand findeth to do, do it what? With all your might. How many likes half-hearted service? Come on, y'all. You know you'd be the first one to leave a penny on that table if that waiter even gave you so much as a... And yet we're told to wait on the Lord. We sang it. Wait on the Lord. And I wish they'd get on with this song. I wish you'd preach something. Good. See, prayer is what keeps not only the body of Christ together, but prayer keeps the family together. Prayer keeps the body together. Elijah's prayer brought down fire. Hannah's prayer brought fruitfulness to her womb. Jabez's prayer gleaned him favor and his borders increased. The 120 up the, in the upper room prayer brought the fire down of the Holy Ghost. Prayer is pivotal. But can we be honest? What's the number one neglected thing in the life of a Christian? But that is supposed to be that's, that's supposed to be what defines us, prayer. It's the anointing that destroys the yoke. It's the anointing that, that, that breaks us free from the things of this world. It's not psychology, not even theology. You don't have to be a theologian to get anointed. You don't have to have every verse memorized and have understanding of everything biblical to get anointed because anybody can pray. Anybody can enter in. Anybody here today, you could have walked in bland and empty and cold and undone and all you got to do is lift up your hand and say, God, I want you in my life. God, I'm reaching. You can be a backslid, messed up prodigal kid smelling of a pig pen. They come walking up the road and God said, I got you. 
That's what seeking the face of God can do. The world will give you a bunch of advice, cause you to speculate in humanistic ways to deal with your issues. And you need this drug. Well, let's go down and have a drink. Or you need a chem you got a chemical dispendency. Or you know, we have broken relationships because we try anything to try to satisfy some sort of internal need in our flesh. And that's why homes are are broken and homes are messed up and lives are falling apart and things can never get going because you're yoked to chaos. Anybody realize you're kind of yoked to chaos instead of Christ? Listen, the reason some of you get bored, and I'm talking about prayer, is because you, you can't get alone by yourself with God and focus for five minutes for a time of prayer because you're addicted to chaos. Wait a minute, it's too quiet. I can't. I get there. Peace often feels like boredom to people who are used to chaos. Did you hear what I said? You're running and jumping and shouting and you got all this pandemonium going on. And to go sit down in prayer is almost painful. Because the I, I saw this thing the other day. This couple, they were, they were in the kitchen working and all you could hear was the kids screaming in the background. And they were all cool with it. But as soon as those kids went silent, they went running up on it. The most dangerous sound in the household is when the kids get quiet. <laughs> That's some of our lives, you know. We are afraid of the silence. We're afraid of the quiet. We're afraid of being honest and, and getting in that place. You know what, God? How can you still hear the still small voice of God when all you got is chaos going on? How, how many of us are really a moment of peace away? from a peace that passes on because we're addicted to our chaos. The truth is in Isaiah 10 and 27, and this is one of the first scriptures I ever highlighted and highlighted in my little new convert Bible. It says, and it shall come to pass in that day that his burden shall be taken away from off thy shoulder and his yoke from off thy neck and the yoke shall be destroyed because of the anointing. Now, listen, I'm not trying to put down education. I'll, I'm going to tell you something right now. God wants to be involved in your business and your finances. He does. I'll tell you right now. God wants you to start that business. He wants you to do that. He, the Bible says he wants to bless your basket. Well, we don't use baskets today. We got wallets and stuff and purses. Well, ladies, purses. Now, I know you put a bunch of junk in there, but it would be all right if we could put a bunch of money in there, right? Well, okay, maybe some of you don't care about that. No, I'm, I'm okay with that, but understand, God's involved in that. You know, he's involved in your health. He's, in, he, he's involved in every aspect of your life. Don't, don't, he's, he's, he's not a fair weather God. He's not some Johnny come late. He's God. He's intimately involved. He knows the numbers of the hair on your head. So I'm not putting all these other things down. I'm just saying that none of those things are a substitute for the anointing. Mark 5, 15 says, And they come to Jesus, and they see him that was possessed with the devil. A legion. And he's sitting clothed and in his right mind. He got his world together. And you know what happened? Everybody else freaked out. I'm gonna say I'm gonna say something here. There are some folks afraid of being healed because you're addicted to your chaos. You're addicted to who you used to be, and you're not willing to let go and let God. Some of you are trying to out Jesus, Jesus in your own life. I'm talking from experience here. One of my favorite sayings, and it, it works smarter, not harder. Why not? If God's able to do things, why are you running around like a chicken with his head cut off, acting like a complete fool with chaos in your life? Doing this, you keep doing the same thing, get the same results, and you think God's not doing his thing. But God can't do his thing because you're too busy doing your thing. Your kids are suffering because you won't do it God's way. You're better than God. You're smarter than God. You're greater than God. You know better than God. Because that's what you say when you won't let God. 
let me take let me let me say this too. There are some people that want you to remain dysfunctional. Them folks were upset that he was healed. You better know spiritually. We wrestle not against flesh and blood. That whatever spirits got your family members or got you, whatever. We can't let them get well. We're having a party in their life. The demons of hell are having a party in your home. They're having a party in your heart and a party. And they got you so messed up, they laugh every time you come to church. Oh, they ain't going to change. We're still going to have, we still got this playground. When I get it, because when, when pastors and the Bible starts talking about this stuff, people bow up. You ever feel that in your flesh? You know you're hearing the truth, but you bow up. You ever see people, they don't want to be submitted to any type of authority. That's a spiritual problem. The Lord said, I will give you pastors after my own heart. Who's your pastor? You ought to be a pastor. You know why? Because you have multiple pastors in your life. Brother Davenport's a bitch, you're not even a pastor. But I submit myself to him. I'm, I'm in charge here, but I want to submit myself. Who, you'd be a fool not to allow people to speak truth into your life. What, you'll go to a mechanic about your car, you're a doctor about your health, which is only temporary, but you ain't going to have a pastor in your life when it comes to eternity? You ain't been reading the book. You got a few little scriptures in there that you got twisted in your head, and you can't be faithful to God, you can't be faithful to church. Well, I don't like that guy, or I don't like that church. That's the least of your worries. Won't you just get into fundamentals and start growing and start learning, because like, like the Ethiopian eunuch said, how can I let some man show me? You know, there's an old saying, a, a, a man who's his own lawyer has a fool for a client. A man who's his own pastor is a fool. Thank God for the men of God in my life. Thank God. Now listen. Remember, some folks want you dysfunctional. And some of us get this, addicted to our dysfunction. We get addicted to it. It's what we know. Familiar spirits. It's familiar. We get comfortable with that. And all of a sudden, someone starts bringing change. Come on. Someone starts wanting to live for God. Isn't it funny? When I, wanted, when I started coming to church, and I, I hate saying what I used to be, but when I started coming to church, I had a whole bunch of horrible stuff. My, my friends, we liked it better when you were. I was getting shot at. You like, that lets you know they're not looking out for you. If someone likes the fact that you have an addiction, if someone's okay with the fact that you're hurting yourself, if someone's okay with the fact that your life's in trouble, I don't know that they're looking out for you. Why is it that we think if someone's hurting themselves, they need help and protection? Physically, why wouldn't it be the same spiritually and morally and relationally? You keep sabotaging your marriage. Maybe it's time you sat down and submitted yourself to a man of God. Hey, hey, youngin. They got gray hair for a reason. They, you may not like everything they tell you to do, but understand, they got, they've been where you haven't. I, I, I make comments to Erica all the time. Wait a minute, youngin. I've been there. You've never been here. Come on, adults. Think about it this way. Sweetheart, Sister Peaches has been there. She's been your age, but you ain't never been where she is. You, you can learn. I say it this way, but you're going to learn a lot from a dummy. I'd rather you learn from my mistakes than make them for yourself. You want to sabotage your marriage? You want to sabotage your family? You want to sabotage your soul? You want to sabotage your attorney? Go ahead and don't listen to the Bible. Don't have a pastor. Don't have a church. Don't have someone that, that you can, you know, I here's the truth. I spend time with multiple ministers over the week. I have men because I've been through things that come to me now. I'll be honest with you. I don't feel 55. I look, look 60, but what happened to that guy who was just running, dunking a basketball yesterday? Time flies, but I'm thankful for the experience that I survived because now I have a ministry to people. I can help you with that dysfunction. I used to have it. Don't walk around acting like you ain't been through something. That you got it all. Those people act like they got it all sewed up. Yeah, they got it all sewed up, all right. They're doomed. Mm -hmm. We talk a lot about the church and the body of Christ, and we should. 
But I want to remind you that as the body of Christ, we are made up of many members, many yes. parts. And just as a body has many parts and organs and bones, and just like a wall has many bricks or blocks or stones, and just as an army is made up of many different individual soldiers. So, listen, the point I'm trying to make is the body can only be revived as its individual members are revived. A wall can only be built by setting and fitting many bricks or blocks or stones. The Bible calls us lively stones, stones that are people that are alive. It says in 1 Peter 2, 5, ye also as lively stones. That's alive, vibrant, not stuck and dead, are built up a spiritual house, a holy priesthood to offer up spiritual. So I came in here to sacrifice today. Acceptable to God. Does that make sense? Are you hearing me? Revival comes only as individual stones are set on fire. Revival has to start with me in my home. My revival starts in my church with me getting on fire. The Bible goes on a few verses later and it says, but you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar people. Wait a minute. That don't sound like worldliness. That don't sound like what's going on out there. That don't sound like confusion. That don't sound like teenagers that are doing all sorts of ridiculousness without any supervision. That doesn't sound like men and women at each other's throats in their marriage. That doesn't sound like chaos. That doesn't sound like confusion. That doesn't sound like gender dysphoria. We're a holy nation, a royal priesthood that we should what? Show for. Say it again, brother. What are you showing forth? What is coming out of your life? What is being omitted from you? Show forth, you should show. There ought to be an admitting of God out of your life. There ought to be some vibrant. God didn't anoint you to walk around angry and upset. That ain't the Holy Ghost. The praises of him who have called you what? Out of darkness. Are you tired of the darkness? Are you tired of ah, I want my house to check. Some of the best thing you could ever do. Is go in there and just get all that junk out of you. I say, we're just going to start over. I want a clean site. God's good with that eraser if you let him. If you let him, get, quit holding on to this and holding on. And let him erase it. Make you clean. Help you rise. Do you realize when the prodigal showed back up? He got some new clothes. Come on. He went down to Dillard's or whatever. Or whatever. Went over to Anthem. Went all the, the, uh, the low. You have to ask Eric what they're called, all those. Help me. Outlets, thank you. Get that God credit card out. I'm going to be brand new. Yeah. I'm changing yeah. my mindset. I'm changing what I've been doing. I'm changing my thinking. I'm changing. I'm, I, I'm going to change my world. You see, Ezekiel chapter 37 is... Definitely and undeniably about revival. The end result is there was an entire army of what was dead being raised up to fight the Lord's battles. He can call you out of the tombs. He can call you out of the graves. He can call. I don't care how ugly and dark it's been. I, it don't matter what he wants. Lazarus come forth and he came forth. That man killing himself, ruining his life in the tomb, and he's clothed that in his right. I'm telling you, you're in a good place right now. You're in a good spot right now. You're in the right place for a revival right now. You set yourself up for success. Can we be honest? How many times have I set myself up for failure? 
How many times I opened my mouth and said the wrong thing, gone the wrong place, did the wrong thing, got mad at the wrong. Oh, I've, I've sabotaged myself enough. You did the right thing. You set yourself up for success today. A good place to start is right here in the house of God. A good place to start where someone's going to speak over you and preach over you. You're in the right place. Dead bones can come back. Sinners, life can be restored. The oil can flow and you can rise up. Warriors in the word of God. What is revival? It is the awakening or quickening of God's people to their true nature and purpose. Yes. Many individual parts coming together for the same purpose. It describes the church, but it describes the body. Cancer cell is still a cell, but it's just going a different direction than the body. So when they give you chemo, when you go, I know a little bit about this, they're trying to kill those cells because they're going to destroy all the other ones. But God can speak to that man. What if? I hope you showed up with a what if today. I believe God has set before you. Spiritually, right now, you, you, right now, everybody say me. An open door and an opportunity for a great revival in your life, in your family, in your home, in your church. In each of our lives, and I'm telling you right now, I believe there's a spirit of revival that's creeping across the land and the world. I believe the wind of God, the breath of God, the Holy Ghost is moving just as he did on the day of Pentecost. And if you'll gather in that one place in one accord, and we start praying like they prayed, and we start fasting like they did, each of us like those dry bones in the valley can respond by the spoken word of God. I believe something, an exceeding great army could rise up, anointed on fire, and all these other things start dropping away, and we walk on anointed. God's going to have, he says he's coming for a church, lets me know, I don't care how dark it gets, there'll be a church when he gets here. There'll be a church when he gets here. I believe the Holy Ghost is raising up a mighty army of blood, washed, Holy Ghost filled. Fire baptized, Bible thumping, pew jumping, aisle running, tongue talking, sin hate, Jesus loving believers. This Bible says the scripture is no private interpretation, so you're off the hook. Quit trying to think you got to figure it all out. I promise you, if you'll get into prayer, you get under the anointing, and you allow God, the Holy Ghost will lead and guide you into all truth. And you can quit being a joker, you can quit being the butt of the judgment. Now, you got some kind of Christianity, but it ain't working. You see, you have to understand, you, you can gather parts, don't mean it's a body. All the parts are right there in the coffin, don't mean it's going to live. Coffin has all the parts, but what's missing? It needs, it needs the spoken word. Are you hearing me? Revival is personal. Well, that family's having a revival. You know why? The members of that family is having a revival. That church is having a revival because the members of that church are having a revival. Before there was an army in Ezekiel's boneyard, just a valley of dry bones. The point is, every bone had a personal revival. Go read it. The life of God, the fire of God, the supernatural power of God, God inside and touched every one of those bones. And every one of those bones, every one of them began to move and move by the power of God. As a church, we gather, we move, we come together with desire to experience a divine visitation. Just, just like the book of Acts, they got a revival, but in reality. The only way to have revival is to become revival. Every bone, just like every person, must commit to the process of personal revival. The wall, the church, 
every everything that comes together with a bunch of as living stones that make up the wall are alive as lively stones. The church is only as alive as the individual members that make up the body are alive. You want revival in your home? Become revival. Don't run around demanding a whole bunch of stuff from your family while you're twice dead, plucked up by the roots. Don't run around demanding submission from everybody around you while you're not submitting. Revival is everybody. Are you hearing me? The first thing in our pursuit of revival that we must decide is we must commit ourselves personally to the process. This is the only time it's okay to say me first. Now when there's one last piece of pie, you always want to let dad get, oh, I mean, let. You know, we used to sing a song. I need to resurrect some of these older songs I'm saying. It's not my brother, not my sister, but it's me, oh Lord. Standing in the need of prayer. Right? Come on, we all know, man. I'm going to be praying for you. Why are the ladies laughing? Why are they laughing? You better pray over that food, sir. <laughs> you see, we may all come together. And I watched it this morning. And I know how hard our music team works, and they do a great job. They do. They gather together. We gather together. The family gathers together. And we can sing and shout and praise God and have a good time in the house of God. But it's important as individuals, as individuals, we catch on fire. We come alive and carry the fire. It's one thing to sing with talent. It's quite another to sing under the anointing. It's one thing to be walking with God because you know what the word says. It's quite another to be walking and living and being that word. It's not how many scriptures you can quote. It's how many you can live. You hearing me? It's important that we get on fire. We come alive. When we, we become revival. Personal revival produces corporate revival. One thing about fire, it spreads. You want your house to change? You first. And quit running around demanding of everybody. Get on fire. Become like Jesus. I promise you, you'll get a following. It's important that every bone comes alive and gets. But I need to warn you. True revival. It's not just jumping up and down. Shouting, talking in tongues. True Bible revival is more than just the Holy Spirit coming by to give you a jump start or a sh shot like a spiritual energy drink. I'm going to say something that's so boring to most of you because the world's caused to be that way. We need to get back to the foundation and tenets of Christianity. Yes. All this newfangled stuff with light shows and all this junk and all these amazing... I, I get it. It's good stuff, but ain't nothing going to replace yes. good old-fashioned alone time and praying yes. Yes. to a holy God. Yes. Don't tell me how spiritual you are. Tell me how much you pray. Come on, and don't tell me how much you pray. Tell me how much you are able to hear that still, small voice. True revival always begins. You hear it? I'm going to say a bad word. Repentance. Boy, that just breeds a whole lot of excitement, doesn't it? You can measure the success of true revival by the depth of repentance. A.W. Tozer said, the blessings follow the plow. We always talk about the crop and reaping a harvest and having all that stuff, but it all begins with digging up the soil. Oh, God, turn me over, turn me inside out, real clean me, cleanse me, help me get myself right. And Jesus said unto him, no man having put his hand to the plow and looking back is fit. Lord, I need you to turn my soil. God's blessings come where the word of God is allowed to penetrate like a seed. Oh, let it get it get in the soil. Let, let, let it germinate and root. And let the Holy Spirit get in there and move and 
oh, I, I need, man, I need to be sweet or I need to be nice. Or I really need to, God, lead and guide me and help me in your word. Break up that fallow ground. How many is tired of the same old hard ground? Seek the face of God. Allow the Lord to till your ground. And then let him rain his righteousness down on you. Because repentance isn't the word we hear about today. You're not going to hear that word in 90% of our churches today. You're not going to hear it. I could say some names of gigantic. They ain't going to tell you to repent. They're just going to tell you all God wants to do is bless you to where you're doing this and doing that and helping them own jet planes. And they're great orators. They're wonderful. They, they know just how to make you feel like... You know, like a life coach making you feel like a million bucks or like that guy get at the gym getting you to work out harder, getting that person to get all excited about getting involved in that scheme. It's going to make you wealthy. You don't ever have to do anything or show up. It's just going to. Are you hearing what I'm saying? Come to this seminar. We're going to show you how to get in real estate. You're going to make millions and never have to work. You're going to work from your phone on the beach. Am I lying? John the Baptist's message was repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Jesus' message was repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Acts 3 and 19, the apostles' message was repent ye therefore and be converted. How many remember how we used the word converted last week? Become a believer and shovel all that junk, those opinions and ideas out that your sins may be blotted out when the times of refreshing shall come. From where? The presence of the Lord. Yes. It's me, it's me, it's me, oh Lord, standing in the need of prayer. That's why you come in here. 30 minutes before service starts, there's people in here. It's me, it's me. And I will hurt nobody's feelings, but you understand, so you blow that off. Ah, you're saying, I really don't need that kind of prayer before the word comes. I don't need to plow in my life. I know the pastor's going to preach a word, but it's all about what he preaches and not about my preparation. It's all on pastor. It's all on the preacher. Sing me into a state of euphoric worship music team. Get anointed, Sister Erica. It's been three and four hours preparing, and then three and four hours with the group, and then pastor, show up with a mighty message that stirs my emotions. And all it does is hit hard soil, and the birds come and take it, and the thoughts and the other things steal it from you. Uh, it's not working for me. Oh. Second Chronicles tells us if, if, let me say if, my people, because you can be his people and not be praying. You can be in the family and not be in good graces. I was the black sheep of the family. I was. I was the outcast. I remember being in the back of the station wagon on my sister. We can't wait till you're out of the house. Who laughed? <laughs> I'm already in the back, very back with the dog. I was already close to the exit pretty clear. <laughs> I'm surprised they didn't hit the button and give me a shove. If my people, which are called by my name, listen to this. Per if you're going to get help today, personalize this. Call by my name, shall humble themselves. A lack of prayer is a lack of humility. No matter how you slice it, no matter how you dice it, no matter or excuses, all that, they're not going to float your boat when you're standing before God. That Titanic is sunk. If you ain't got the humility enough to say, I got to pray. I'm going to sing my wife's praises. I'm telling you, I'm, I'm, guys, I'm blessed. It gets even halfway sideways in my house. Oh, I need to go pray. She'll get up and say, you know what? It, I got to be in prayer today. Oh, no, I need to pray. You know what she texted me first thing this morning? Not hi, hello, honey, I love you. 
I'm praying and fasting for the church service. Jesus. We got a good one around here. We got a good one around. She ain't playing games. She's praying. But why? If my people will, oh, thank God, thank God, thank God, thank God, thank God, thank God. How many thankful for those that are here early for prayer? How many come in here and love the sound of the prayer and the time? Do you realize? There are people getting here at 7.45, 8 o'clock. There are people teaching a lesson at 8.30. There are people in a meeting at 9, and they're even getting it. And it's too hard to, mm, I wonder, if my people, if my people shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways. You ain't doing nothing wicked if you're in prayer. Well, come on. You do. I remember being told this as young people, if you, if you spend so much time doing the right things, you ain't got to worry about doing something wrong. Then will I hear from heaven and will forgive their sins and heal. Maybe your marriage will be healed if you humil humble yourself and pray. Maybe your family will come back together if you humble yourself, submit yourself, and pray. Maybe that job and the finances and all the chaos can be calmed, and the, and the peace speaker can speak peace if you humble yourself and invite him into. He's not afraid of the chaos. He works pretty good in it. He can walk up to a demoniac and have him and leave him in his right mind. He can walk into people sick with leprosy and they be healed and made whole. He can walk into your mess and make it a miracle. But will you invite him? Will you humble yourself and seek his face and he'll heal your land? Now, I know that don't float your boat because we just want to throw a dollar in the air and say, God bless me. And all of a sudden you're going to be wealthy. doesn't work that way, folks. The first step in your personal revival will be to humble yourself and pray. One of the greatest sins in modern-day American church is the sin of prayerlessness. I get people that give me a lot of advice. I got a lot of people tell me how I need to do this and how I do that. And I'm fine with it. I get it. But here's my advice for you. You need to get a prayer life. You need a prayer life. You can, you, you can, every time, every time someone comes to me and gives me advice, I'm like, I wonder how much they pray. I wonder how much they really seek the face of God, humble themselves to hear the voice of God. I'm wondering why I'm not seeing. They want revival here, but what about revival starting in you? What about revival starting in your family, and then you are revival when you come? Let me help you. It ain't on me. My revival's on me. Your revival's on you. And we are revival when we come here and the church has revival. Are you hearing what I'm saying? Lake, Lake Mead. I think it's Lake Mead's in a severe, we got a drought going on right now and all of a sudden these barrels are showing up with bodies in them and there's boats being, well, okay, maybe y'all y'all don't, don't do any studying and researching. But, but the greatest drought isn't with water. It's not what's happening at Lake Mead, that it's reached the lowest point it has in, I don't know, 100 years. The greatest drought is not for rain. It, it, it literally is for tears. The drought in today's church, and we always talk about the good old days. You know what made the good old days? They prayed. Don't, don't talk to me about the good old days if you ain't going to pray like the good old days. We have a church age that has a drought of dry eyes. You're unmoved. Entertain us. Sing. Who's singing this? Or who's? We are in a grip, a grip right now of a drought of dry eyes. I'm not. I'm not surprised with the lack of power in a person's life or in a church. A prayerless church is a powerless church. One of the first things every speaker that comes here says is, "Man, it's powerful. You got people praying." I don't know about you, but I'd be involved in that. You ever remember what the guy said was all crippled up? I can't let someone put me in. You know what? If you want the healing, maybe you ought to get yourself in it. Why don't you put yourself in it? You see the water stirring. You know it's stirring here. Get in it. A steam engine is powered by steam. A gas engine is powered by gas. An electric engine is powered by electricity. A church is powered by prayer. Yes. Amen. Amen. Can I put can I go ahead and give you just a little bit today? 
You want fire in the pulpit, get prayer in the pew. Sadly, most of the prayers you only hear in churches today is the short opening prayer and a prayer dismissal. Jesus said, my house will be called the house of prayer. And it seems like we do everything except pray. Okay, let me give you a picture. That's like you walking in and out of your house and never speaking to your spouse. Well, let's be real. How many of y'all know that silent, that silentness, that sticking? Okay, maybe I'm the only one knows about that. Come on. That little issue. You know, you know I said, you know, and then y'all don't talk for two days. I know y'all don't know nothing about that. How many of us have had the silent treatment with God for so long? We do everything in the church today. Eating meetings. Plays, potlucks, fellowship meetings. Even our Bible study is more well attended than our prayer meetings. Why don't we have power with God? I'm not making you feel bad. I'm handing you something. Anybody ever hand you a free toolbox with a bunch of tools in it? You'll get in the best toolbox you ever get in right now. Why don't I have power over the devil? Why are these old things still got liberty in my life? Why, why aren't people getting saved, healed, and delivered? Why aren't people being filled with the Holy Ghost? Why, God, why aren't you sending the fire? Who's praying? Just like Elijah on Mount Carmel. 455, they spent hours doing all this weird stuff to themselves. Elijah spends all that time digging and building an altar and dousing the fire. They spent a few minutes in prayer. Because even the weakest Christian on their knees is a threat to hell. I'm telling you right now, I'm not trying to make you feel bad if you're in a state or guilty of it. I'm telling you right now, even in that state, in prayer, hell is afraid of you. That demon, that struggle, that problem that's been beating you up, that thing that's been messing with your head, that, that problem that's been plaguing your family starts to realize it's an endangered species when even the weakest Christian gets down and says, oh, God, help me. Oh, God, help me. When David came to Ziklag and his wives were gone, his children, and the house was burnt down and everybody wanted to kill him, it don't get worse than that. You know what he did? Give me the ephod. It's time to pray. And I can just hear God saying, that's all I've been waiting for. And he said, God, shall I pursue? Shall I recover all? He said, pursue, David. You're going to get it all back. How did it start? He prayed when there was chaos. He prayed when he had nothing but ashes in his head. He prayed when everything was gone. He saw God and God said, I can give it back to you. Heaven's greatest jewel and hell's greatest dread is a saint of God on their knees, a praying church. Because on our knees, we can shake hell. On our knees, we can open the windows of heaven. On our knees, we can rage a war. On our knees, we can wrestle souls right out of Satan's power. On our knees, we can pull down those strongholds. On our knees, uh, we can lay the foundation of the kingdom of God. The greatest indicator of a visitation from God is a church on fire in prayer. And when the day of Pentecost was fully come, and this is why, this is, this is the whole point of the church. This is the whole point of the Gospels. And so many people get so confused because they don't understand the theology of the church. They don't understand what the Gospels are. They don't understand what the book of Acts is. They don't understand what Romans is. They don't understand what Revelation is. They, they think they do, and they get these scriptures all out of whack, and they don't understand how it works. And when the day of Pentecost, this is the whole point they were all with one accord in one place. And suddenly 
there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind, and it filled all the house where they were sitting. And there appeared unto them cloven tongues like a fire, and it sat upon each of them. It would have been confusing if not everybody got it. And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Prayerless saints are powerless saints. The church started on fire and in power. Okay, this is just a Brother Crow funny here. Saint and prayerless is actually oxymoronic. Because you can't be a true saint without prayer. So as those 120 gathered in that upper room, it was an upper room. They didn't have carpet. They didn't have these kind of lights. You hear that sound of that air? They didn't have air conditioning. They didn't have someone up here singing and playing. They didn't have all this stuff to get you worked up and emotionally cleansed of all the junk you threw into your life last week, all the things that you went and did and said and saw and listened to. You didn't need all that prepper. They gathered, and every head got a flame. Yes. Amen. That's Pentecost. Personal power comes through personal prayer. They didn't set aside and let them get it, and let's follow along. Each and every one of them were filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak in other tongues. Yes. Prayer is the key to heaven's treasure's house. All the resources of heaven wait for the demand of prayer. The Bible says you have not because you ask not. Matthew 7, 7, asking you shall receive, seeking you shall find. Knocking the door shall be opened to you. John 14 to 13, whatsoever you ask in my name, that will I do. Mark 11 to 24, whatsoever things you desire. When ye pray, believe that you receive them and you shall have them. Ye have not because ye ask not. The power of prayer is unlimited because prayer accesses the unlimited power of God. So why is it that we are so prayerless? Do you realize a man prayed and shut up the heavens from rain for three and a half years? And the same man turned and prayed and unlocked those. You know what it says about this guy? Are you ready? But those were special people, and they were specially anointed. And they had stuff. They didn't, they didn't have internet and media. And all. Elias was a man subject to like passions as we are. Time and chance happen at the all. He's subject to just like us. But it says, and he prayed earnestly. Not carelessly. Not every now and then. Earnestly. That it might not rain, and it rained not on the earth by the space of three years and six months. And then in verse 18 it says, and he prayed again. You realize everything's premised by prayer? And heaven gave rain, and the earth brought forth her fruit. In Revelation chapter 8, says, there was an angel at the altar with a golden center, filled with incense, and it was mixed with the prayers of the saints. And the angel took fire from off the altar and mixed it with the prayers of the saints and cast it to the earth, and there were voices and thunderings and lightnings. It's a revelation of the power of prayer and how God takes the prayers of the saints and uses them to manifest power. Let's stand. God's power is manifested in proportion to the prayers of the saints. Everything starts with a prayer. Listen, I like all the other stuff. Let me put this way. I like air conditioning in my car. Well, wait a minute. I like it in my house, too. <laughs> wait, what about that? Dude? I, like them. I like them nice seats, and I like them. Gas pedal and all that one, but I tell you what, if it didn't have gasoline and an engine, it well, I'm not going to sit in the dumb thing. And I didn't want to be in my own house when it didn't have air conditioning. You can have all the bells and you can have all the bells and whistles in life there is. We can preach and run and jump and shout and dance and talk in tongues, but as far as advancing the kingdom of God is concerned, we don't move forward without prayer. We haven't done anything at all until we've truly 
prayed or become people of prayer. It was at midnight, Paul and Silas prayed and sang praises unto God. It was not an optimum situation. There was no air conditioning. They didn't have full bellies. They were bleeding from wounds, and they prayed and sang praises. If we want what they had, We've got to do what they did. Why, why have we just set aside what made the church powerful? Why have we stopped doing what it took to get the miracles? Where are those things gone? It, it's the power. Of, Elijah rebuilt the altar of prayer. The greatest fear the devil has is that the church will rebuild an altar. Listen, we can talk how bad and how wicked the world is. And I can sit down there and we can talk about it all day long. We can cry about how worldly some people are in the church. But nothing's going to change until we pray. We used to understand that prayer was warfare. If I had a stack of rifles on that wall in a gun case, and all of a sudden we had some enemy coming to the door, Every man would run and grab a rifle and stand at the ready to protect everybody else in the cell, right? We got a bunch of spiritual wickedness going on. Where's our men in prayer? That's good. That's good, sir. We used to call praying saints prayer warriors. How many remember that? Because that's the only way to revive that. That's really the only hope for America and our world for our family, for ourselves. And I, I, know, I know it's not, it's not glamorous. It's not exciting. It's not, it's not going to get your name in lights. But all heaven will see. And I'll be honest with you. I don't like any politician. Because they are not the answer and they never will be. Jesus is. And our world is messed up because we've handed it to politicians instead of God. Ain't none of them good. Ain't none of them right. Ain't they all in it for the money. The answer is not them. Uh huh. Are you hearing me? There ain't no party that's right. Only God. The only hope is God. I don't. I don't. I don't need to vote a certain way to make it to heaven, but I tell you what, I better have God. Amen. We need God back in our homes. Amen. God back in our schools. Amen. They can't keep God out if our kids are taking them in. Amen. They can't keep God out of your job if you'll take them in there. They can't. They can push back, but they can't get rid of them because we are walking, talking revival. And the only real way, honest way, to get God back in our lives like he wants to do his prayer. Where are the prayer warriors? You, 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 you want a position around here that matters? You want a title that makes a difference and everybody needs to stop and listen? Let me tell you something. You want to be heard? Get in prayer. Amen. Everything else is secondary. It's time for personal revival. It's time that your family, your household is the head and not the tail. It is time you are an overcomer instead of an underachiever. He's called us to that. This is not self-help. This is Bible. I called you to be the head and not the tail. In Acts 12, there's an interesting story and I want to close with this. Now about the time Herod the king stretched forth his hands to vex certain of the church. When that, that politician turned to a couple of our preachers and said, we know exactly who you are, we're coming for you. It's because they want to stop the church. Because as long as God's in control, they can't have it from you. That's right. Go. Go look up Dietrich Bonhoeffer and what he did to Nazi Germany. Go look up those people that stood and did what was right in the face of whatever the politicians were doing. No matter what era, God has a church. Even when pandemonium was going around, there are people still in prayer. And so Herod the king stretched towards them to vex the church. And he killed James, the brother of John, with a sword. And because he saw it pleased the Jews, he proceeded further to take Peter also. 
And when he had apprehended him, he put him in prison and delivered him to the four centurions and soldiers to keep him, intending after Easter to bring him forth to the people. Peter was therefore kept in prison. Does that sound bad? What are we going to do? They've just come. They grabbed pastor and they got me down in jail. Some of y'all be like, probably deserved it. Well, who we got coming in next? You spend more time gossiping about every little thing that goes on with people in the church. If you ain't got nothing good to say, don't say nothing at all. But that ain't right either. If you ain't got nothing good to say, get your carcass in prayer. Go talk to God. What happened? To vex the church. Understand what's going on in the world. They want to stop this. They want to stop this. They even want to stop the, the crazy, ridiculous religions out there. That's why they just passed that thing to promote atheism. They got to get rid of God. It don't matter. They're all, they're all in cahoots. Right wing, left wing, it's all the same bird. They're not the answer, Jesus is. You know what that, you know how the people of God responded to one of theirs in prison? But prayer was made without ceasing of the church. Of the church. They had a praying church. Not the building, the people. You, me, us in prayer unto God for him. And that's what prayer can do. Amen. And the angel of the Lord walked in there and smacked and knocked the chains off of him. They didn't go to the mayor. They didn't write a letter to the governor. They hit the knees. And they got in prayer. I tell you all, you want power in your home? Bring prayer back. Come on, amen. Turn off all that other fake, false junk. Turn it off. Your walls ought to echo with prayer. Angel released him. But here, listen, he, he's showing up to where they're at. And Peter knocked at the door of the gate and a young lady came to hearken named Rhoda. And when she knew Peter's voice, she opened not the gate for gladness. We need a few excited people around here. But ran in and told how Peter stood before the gate and they said unto her, Thou art mad. Ain't that how some of us are? You, you get down, you say a few words, and you get up and walk away. Oh, whatever. Let me get back to doing it my way because, you know, God just didn't answer right now. Can I be where we are? Can I be real? That's where the enemy wants you because he knows that even the weakest person in here in prayer puts him on notice. Even the most mixed up, messed up head in prayer is more powerful than the enemy. Even a family that's full of brokenness and woe and life that's full of excuses of why not is all undone the moment a person gets down in prayer and seeks the face of God. They told her you're mad, but she constantly affirmed that it was so. Then they said, oh, it's his angel. So you can believe an angel can show up, but God can't. God's not just interested in angels. He's interested in you. He's interested in you. Let's focus on, on what we understand and no one can agree on. But Peter continued knocking, and when they had opened the door, they saw him, and they were astonished. Why would I read that one? Is there anyone here ready to start seeing the prisoners in your life? Those in chains of alcohol drugs and worldliness and messed up mindsets those that are lost and hurting bound sick struggling ill what do you do when you're facing that where's the sound of prayer where's the powerful sound of prayer where's that sound that invokes all of heaven where's that sound today at souls harbor there's issue there's cancer in here 
There's relationships hanging by a string in here. There are, there are parents in here of kids that are facing and struggling things you can't even believe right now. Where's the sound of prayer in the adult Sunday school class? We have an altar. We have church. We got all the other trappings of air conditioning. But will prayer be heard today? 